So I want to introduce our first presenter for this morning. You met Rabbi Seth last night as he was part of our interfaith worship service. He does like to be called Rabbi Seth, by the way. Um, he retired as a chaplain from the U.S. Navy. Prior to that, he was a civilian rabbi in Naples, Florida, and Melbourne, Australia. So you can have those conversations. He is a magna cum laude graduate of the Pennsylvania State University with a Master of Hebrew Letters and Rabbinic Ordination from the Hebrew Union College. Seeing Allentown's only Reformed community, Congregation Kenneth Israel, as a place of comfort and continuity, he has sought to empower members to find their ways to live Jewishly, to express their passions for Takan Olam and spirituality as well as involvement with interfaith and social justice causes. He is especially proud of the involvement of KI members on community boards and as associate members of other synagogues. A gifted teacher, an uplifting speaker, a person with a great sense of humor. That's not in his bio. A comforting presence at life cycle events, Rabbi Seth is known for his matching ties and socks, so check them out. The lovely Marge has shared with him sailors and congregants for 19 years and counting. They together share three children, five grandchildren, a love of travel, and crossword puzzles. So send all your New York Times crossword puzzles to Rabbi Seth. <laughs> Without any further ado, I introduce to you my friend and colleague, Rabbi Seth. Um, thank you, Bonnie, um, friends. I'll paraphrase Lyndon Johnson, who after a glowing invitation, uh, introduction like that said, uh, his father would have been proud of that and his mother would have believed it. So uh, <laughs> thinking about Penn State and academic achievements, gosh, feels like an awfully long time ago and probably, yes, I'm very proud that uh, congregation Knesset Israel is a place of comfort and continuity, and our motto is a place where we have conversations that matter. And uh, I'll, 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 give, I'll share that phrase with you as a definition for some of the work that we do. Uh, the name of our congregation, the reason why it is always abbreviated, oh, I'm at KI, I'm at KI on the Muhlenberg campus, KI 23rd and True, is because very few people can pronounce the uh, Ang Anglicization, I don't know that's the, the right word, of the Hebrew. The Hebrew word is Knesset, as in the Israeli parliament is a Knesset, which means the same thing as congregation. So um, just like New York, New York, so good they had to name it twice. So our official name is the Congregation of the Congregation of Israel. <laughs> but what worked for me is... Um, I told them uh, 10 years ago, they needed to uh, engage me, call me as it were, because my name was carved in stone on the building. So Knesset Israel, and it obviously worked. Uh, they have not been able to replace me with a settled or permanent uh, rabbi coming up uh, in July. They have a, t uh, a temp as it were, an interim, um, but they're looking really hard for a rabbi can to uh, take my place. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so uh, what I thought I'd do is give you uh, some overall rules. Uh, I mean, you know, I get that we've got a Baha'i speaker here and we all need to know about Baha'is and Muslims and uh, talking to a group of uh, Christians, uh, educated Christians through theology and uh, through seminary. Uh, I do know that you have some background in what it is that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, but certainly with the slides, I will reveal to you the big mystery um, and, and fair enough that you may not have in your training focused in on this, but 
first some general rules. First of all, I cannot stress strongly enough, two Jews, three opinions on any one subject. So we love our diversity in Judaism, even though birds of a feather do flock together and we more or less organize ourselves uh, from left to right or newest to oldest, reform, conservative, and an orthodox. Okay. Obviously, within each of those groupings, there are subgroupings and uh, differences of opinion. One of the reasons why our uh, inter-Jewish relationships are so harmonious in the in the Lehigh Valley, and I'm specifically using a smaller uh, area than New York City or Jerusalem or something like that, is because we only have one of each flavor, one reform congregation, one conservative, one orthodox, which means we're never looking over our shoulder internally to the left or to the right for someone who would be more or less than us and therefore feel free to criticize. So that's why I, as a reform rabbi, so that's my day job, shepherding uh, and learning from the folks at KI on uh, 23rd and Chu Street. And, and some of you have been there with confirmation classes, so I do know some of you, and you've, you've been to that beautiful uh, building. Uh, on the Muhlenberg campus or surrounded by Muhlenberg. So I'm, my day job is the rabbi of KI. I will be retiring from there, as Bonnie has said, uh, the end of June. But my spiritual journey, I am a active participating member, uh, when I can, of the Orthodox congregation. So again, in Christian terms, we've got our uh, Unitarians and, and all of that on the one side, the liberal reform side, and we've got our fundamentalists on the Orthodox side. And somehow in Allentown, uh, I walked in, sat down, people talked to me, and that doesn't happen in other places crossing those birds of a feather line. So uh, two Jews, three opinions, uh, but we would like to think on the, uh, the meta level that what we have in common uh, is, the, is, is that sense of unity. Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And yet we've chosen to uh, interpret that and understand that in, uh, in, in different ways. So two Jews, three opinions, birds of a feather. And you've heard the big words, reform, conservative and orthodox from left to center to uh, to to write. Uh, that's a pretty good a pretty good thing to uh, to know. I suppose giving you the uh, 11th commandment, no caffeinated coffee after 2 p.m. or salad dressing on the side. Those are diff that just shows the difference of Jewish opinions. OK, Judaism is a do it religion and a do-it-yourself religion. Those are two phrases that I've always found helpful in explaining who, who we are. And notice that I'm leaving out theological or religious civilization. It's a do-it religion and it's a do-it-yourself religion. It's do it because our connection with the God of Israel, with the people of Israel, is expressed through actions. Truthfully, um, Despite zillions of words being written on Judaism, despite zillions of disagreements by learned rabbis over the centuries, Judaism cares about what you do, okay, not what you believe. Yes, you've got to believe that uh, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, uh, that the Lord is a loving God and, an ex and asks for an exclusive relationship. But as I gave you the blessing for study, which starts out any Jewish day, how do we establish our relationship with God? It is not through the words and the prayers, though God loves our praise and uh, Anyone who's going, who has Psalms as a daily devotion or weekly devotion knows that the Lord God loves our praise, not because he, she, or they needs our puny words. It's we need to be in a relationship where gratitude and enthusiasm shapes us. Okay. So hero Israel. Okay. So sorry, excuse me. 
God cares about our actions. That's how we relate to God. So the blessing that I shared with you uh, yesterday, the formula for any Jewish action, again, it's a do it religion, any Jewish action. Uh, blessed are you, Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who has sanctified us by commandment. So I'm dealing with religious professionals. I'll use the word sanctified, uh, but, it, but indeed I often translate it. Show, given us highways to holiness, okay, and commanded us to wash our hands. Okay, that's actually the first words that use God's name in the morning. So the act of washing one's hands is a religious action in Judaism, in this do it system. Washing your hands, engaging in study, and countless, uh, Rabbi Meir, a second century rabbi said, a person should use that formula 100 times a day. In other words, should see oneself engaged in a relationship, a do it relationship with God, in a hundred different ways, that in the course of a day, there would be a hundred different touch points, connection points with the Lord God, with the, with the God of Israel, with the creator, whatever words you want, doesn't really matter. God has 72 different names, but you're doing something all the time. So truly, as I tell my congregants on Friday night, when we have worship services or the occasional Saturday morning or, or holy day, God knows you're not breaking any of the Ten Commandments here in the side, these, in this sanctuary, the real test of observing the commandments will be when you get outside. So Judaism in this do it system sees not just the top 10 commandments, which are uh, NBD, no big deal in Judaism, no real special uh, preference or uh, privilege for uh, those mountaintop words, but indeed a system of 613 commandments for every day. So all time has these holy, sacred touch points and obligations and all parts of our body. So Judaism as a do it religion is for the bedroom, the boardroom, the bathroom, the battlefield of all places, not just the sanctuary. So it is a, a lived religion in one's everyday life. And, um, when we get to the slides, you'll see an expansion of how we go from observe the Sabbath day to the things that really help us living our lives. So Judaism is do it religion. It's a do it yourself religion, which explains my role. Okay. So rabbi does mean teacher, as you, as you well know, it does not mean priest. So, um, again, with your familiarity with the, I'll use your word, the Old Testament, you're aware of the whole system of temple in Jerusalem, Mount Moriah, temple in Jerusalem, priestly class, tribe of Levi, descendants of Aaron, and the role of, of, of animal sacrifices. Those were the do-its prior to the year, or the system, the religious system, prior to the year 70 CE, okay, of the common era. Now, I grew up in the South, and I knew a rabbi who was once really almost ridden out of town on a, you know, tarred and feathered and ridden out of town on a rail, because he was giving a talk like this in the South to, you know, Christian neighbors and all of that. And he referred to Jewish time, not as in before Christ, B.C., and Anno Domini. So he used the Jewish C.E., the common era and they thought they really were very upset because they heard E-R-R-O-R -R -R, as in, are you saying that we all have made an error in our belief? So the common era, same thing as A.D., okay, but Jewish time. So when the temple is destroyed in the year 70, uh, sanctuary animals or temple animal sacrifices and priestly class disappeared. What took its place? Why didn't Judaism die in the year 70? Okay. Now we survived that last destructive experience in 586 BCE, before the common era, 
We went into exile in Babylonia. We learned to sing the Lord's song in a strange land, and therefore we survived. Judaism, while it has a very specific place, the land of Israel, that's where our history took place, we survived exile. Okay, something that didn't happen in the ancient world. You destroy the God's temple, you take the people out of the God's uh, jurisdiction, as it were, and, and that people die. We were transplanted to Babylonia, we came back, we started all over again. But in the year 70, okay, here's where this is one of these delightful ironies of history. How do we know about rabbis in Judaism? How do we know about synagogues, Knesset Israel, whether you call it a temple or a synagogue, same word, or a shul, same word, same concept. How do we know, where in the Hebrew Bible do we read about rabbis, synagogues, prayer, and commandments as the way to relate to God? It is a trick question. The answer is no. What? The, the Gospels, exactly. Not exactly a Jewish book, but indeed, just like the preservation of the book of Maccabees or Ben Sira, for which we're grateful to our Christian neighbors. So yes, the Gospels is a first century accounting of Jewish life where you see the two parallel systems. You see, yes, Jesus, young reformer, whippersnapper, in the temple, Okay, disagreeing, and uh, if we had much more time than a half hour, uh, we, <laughs> we, 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 we could talk about what that might have meant from a Jewish perspective. But you see the temple sacrificial priestly class, cult, as it were, and you see rabbi teachers, you see synagogues, localized houses of prayer, and you see prayer and reading of the scripture as the way to relate to God. So there's plenty of Jewish accounts for this, but it's extra biblical. It's the work of the rabbis, and we'll get to that uh, with the slides. But Judaism is a do-it-yourself religion. Anything that I do as a teacher, any 13-year-old could indeed do. Anyone is empowered to lead the service, read from the Torah, Holy Scriptures, the lectionary, uh, advise people. Now, clearly, we all know a little bit about healing, you know, chicken soup or stuff like that, but we tend to go to specialists. So rabbis in the, the, uh, have become the Jews. Jewish specialists, though last evening when beloved Rabbi Seth was here with you, as opposed to my duty station, uh, Congregation Knesset Israel, uh, one of our lay people was empowered and gave a lovely service. So Judaism, the do-it-yourself religion, it falls on everyone. Everyone has the same opportunity to approach the commandments, a relationship with God. Uh, the, ho the holidays, well, let's talk about the Passover. And and again, many is the time I've come to a church basement or assembly hall and uh, either shown you what Jews are still doing today in the absence of a Paschal lamb and animal sacrifices, shown you what Jews have done today or been a resource for you as you're celebrating a Christian Passover. But that's not need a rabbi, that needs a leader. That's done in home. So the Jewish home is the place where Judaism takes place for sure. Yes, we have liturgy in the synagogue for all of our holy days and holidays, but it's a do-it-yourself religion. Also by do-it-yourself, it means that each Jew is responsible for his, her, their relationship with God. There are no intermediaries to speed our prayers up to heaven or get them there uh, better than the ordinary person could do. Do it yourself. We're responsible for the doing, the relationship with God. And I guess is do it yourself. We're all uh, Jewish all. <laughs> we Jewish alls are on an equal footing for our path towards life. Now, I certainly know that this is not the predestination Christian crowd, uh, but I'll simply say that as Jews, we're all born neutral. In fact, well, anyone who's been a parent knows that we're actually born selfish and demanding little creatures and the part of civilizing 
or raising children is to get them to think beyond themselves, uh, you know, either what goes in at one end or what comes out at the other end. Uh, but, but indeed, there is nothing about our human Jewish creation that precludes us from this intimate relationship with God, approaching God fully into God's presence. And we do that ourselves. The rabbi doesn't get people connected up with God in that intimate way. I teach them what the prayers might be or the rituals might be, but they go directly to God. They're responsible. Um, gosh, uh, I am really old, but I think I can quote, Flip Wilson hasn't become an unperson. Perhaps like so many of the other of my childhood TV icons. Okay, so, so you know, the devil made me do that. That's not an answer that Jews can use. We're responsible ourselves. So do it religion with action, the commandments, highways to holiness, uh, connection points, do it yourself. Uh, rabbis are guides, but not the leaders. We're equally uh, responsible for heading up to God. Okay, so those are some of those broad rules for thinking about Judaism. I'm gonna turn on just very subtly who knows what to do. Okay. So, you're not connected to the internet. Sorry. <laughs> like all of us who have to do Zoom each week or live streaming, I sort of say what it is that I'm doing and that really bothers some people. Okay. Thank you, Doug. Okay, whew, look at that. So here's the best kept secret in Judaism. If all you know about us is the Old Testament, I'm pre, uh, you'll see a slide that says that. You really have missed the last 2,000 years um, and what makes Jews Jews, okay? And your knowledge of the Gospels okay, really does give you, ironically, more than a whole lot of other Jews, uh, a real idea of how our religion, our faith, our relationship with God has developed. So I'm going to use an American analogy, okay? So how did we get from the Constitution of the United States, which is a one-page document, okay? It's all been to the archives, seen it. How did we get from we the people to that massive volume? Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me set it up here for you. <laughs> to that massive bookshelf. Okay, thank you. Now, slide, please. Woo. Okay. So... <laughs> So again, we've got the Code of the United States. That's what that bookshelf was. It's uh, 60,000 pages, 54 volumes. Okay, how did we get from the Constitution? So it has something to do with Congress, the Congressional Record, and the Supreme Court. Okay, this is probably if I were talking to your youth ministers, I'd need to do this civics lesson, so I apologize. Okay. Well, the same process that happens with American laws going from the Constitution as one page into the rules and regs that guide us and what everything about government, there certainly is a lot of guidance. Okay, so here we go in the Jewish religion. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Okay, on it you shall not do any work. That's what we've got. So what is, okay, so, so of that verse, interpreting it, what's the real problem there? It's not the six, and it's not the Lord your God, it's the definition of work. Exactly, thank you. Oh, Doug, <laughs> I'm faster than you in this case. I've traumatized Doug, I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> okay, so, so there are really three verses that describe what work that work is. Okay? Don't go out of your place, don't kindle a fire, and don't uh, pick up sticks, as it were. But everything else that happens from 18 minutes before sundown on Friday to 45 minutes after sundown on Saturday, so is getting dressed work, is eating work, is cooking work, is mowing the lawn work, is going to the mall work. All of those things uh, now, as the next slide shows, 
That, 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 that's all. I guess I can't do that anymore. That's all, folks. Okay. So here we have a whole people, thousands of years old, all over the world, the Jewish people, and the owner's manual is really kind of unhelpful. Okay. Lightning will not strike me down. I've used that line before. So it really does not tell us. So in moving along, turn the next slide. How do we know what work is? And if that's less of a consequence in dealing with the Hebrew Bible, how about all the icky things that are in there, like drunken and rebellious son? Okay, that's in there. And of course, my favorite, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You know, what's the difference as I've heard so many Christian uh, far righter than you are, as in on that politically saying, you know, an angry Old Testament Jehovah versus the God of love. And they always cite an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Okay. So how do we know what we know? Grammar alert. And for those of you who did not run out of the room, horrified when I reminded you of Hebrew, Ele ha-chukim ve-ha-mishpatim ha-torot. Asher Natan Adonai Abeninu. These are the laws, rules, and literally plural, the Torahs that the Lord God has established through Moses on Mount Sinai between himself and the Israelite people. So that's a physical Torah as used liturgically uh, in the synagogue, read on the Sabbath, starting with Genesis and a, a year later finishing up with Deuteronomy. So that's our lectionary uh, cycle. Obviously, at home, we all read from printed books, okay, and thank goodness, or, or, <laughs> or thanks to digitiz digitization, uh, we use our phones. So, <laughs> so when you finish with a Jewish book, you close the book, you kiss it, and then you place it on the shelf. So I've known many a rabbi who's uh, at a prayer service where people aren't using books, but are reading the liturgy off of their phone at the end, say, now don't kiss your phone before you put it back in your pocket. But the reverence for physical objects, for books, and yet we find in the book of books, it refers to the Torah as a plural. Okay, so how do we know this stuff? So that lets us into Moses received the written law at Mount Sinai. And I'm sorry, that was a screenshot capture. That is from the Mel Brooks history of the world where Moses comes down with the 50, uh, 10 commandments. Okay. But indeed, Moses also received the oral, O-R-A-L law, which was then transmitted from Moses to Joshua, to the prophets, to the men of the great assembly, down into historic times. We've got the names of the people who brought the tradition from Sinai literally to our present day. So the Old Testament isn't old and it doesn't encompass the totality of God's revelation to us. And again, just another example in the place where the Lord, your God has chosen to establish his name is too far from you. So Deuteronomy, does Deuteronomy strike you as sometimes like, well, whoa, this is filled with new laws. Well, yeah, it's to a new generation 40 years later. And it leaves out certain things like where is the place that God's name is going to dwell? And the, as I have instructed you, so how do we know where that that is. Um, and again, this is from a little paragraph that back in the wilderness, you could only eat meat at the temple. Now you can have a barbecue anywhere. Okay. So the Talmud, okay. And that's not Talmud. Sorry. I grew up in the South where they couldn't even pronounce my name. So I'm certainly traumatized with Jewish pronunciation. So the Talmud serves as the congressional record of the discussions of a group of post biblical teachers. Okay. And that's the 24 or 26 or 28 large volumes of, and it's not even Hebrew. It's Aramaic only. Okay, so what is that? So if Talmud equals oral law, the other thing that was revealed on Mount Sinai, so the works of the rabbis have a sanctity, 
Okay. I mean, the discussions of the church fathers or Billy Graham's sermons, they're all inspired and all wonderful, but I don't think Christians claim they have the same thing as the words of, uh, of Jesus. Okay. So the oral law was finally written down in two parts, Mishnah, 200 common era and Gemara. Okay, this is way in the weeds and you can feel free to ignore this. But indeed, how do we know what work is? How do we darshan? How do we interpret the drunken and rebellious son? Uh, good news, it's a sort of a Kaiser Soze to scare the living daylights out of your bad kids. Uh, the, the, the safeguards placed around that are such that it was never carried out. Just as uh, Lex Talonius, the eye for an eye, was actually both workmen's compensation and an upward limit to our natural desire for vengeance and getting even. So if I step on your foot and, or if I bump someone's water on the way out, the most you can do is throw water at me, okay? More, but you can't chop off my head. If I bump your water over, you can't kill me for that. So eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth does say like for like with punishment, okay? Not more than that. Fathers and mothers can't put their own children to death. They have to take them and part of a process Again, understanding beyond the black and white of the biblical, the rabbinic discussions. So the Mishnah, six sections. And again, Judaism deals with everyday life, not just the sanctuary. So prayers and blessing ties, agricultural laws, the festivals, women, okay, marriage and divorce. Uh, can I tell you that I'm right now studying a section for three months that deals with Two brothers marry two sisters. If one of the brothers dies, the whole, what you know is the Leverite marriage. Boy, does it get complicated. Damages, because we live in the world. I borrow your car and I run it out of gas. And while it's on the side of the road, it gets hit. Who's responsible? I am, unless you knew that the gas gauge was faulty and you didn't tell me. And so when it ran out of gas, I had no, it's not my fault. It's bang on to you. Okay. Kodashin, the holy things, the temple, the Talmud. Okay. While parts of it predate, well, obviously it predates the destruction of the temple, but it's a document just like parts of uh, Ezekiel for the third temple. Wait, wait, what was it back when? And when God restores us to the land and we come back singing, as the Psalms say, uh, how do we rebuild it? So it, uh, it's incredible. I've, well, we'll leave a cross. Ask me about animal sacrifice to someone. And finally, the laws of purity, okay? So, so those are just broad headings, okay? But again, thousands and thousands of years and students. That's what a page of Talmud, uh, <laughs> I'm so excited about this. That's what a page of Talmud looks like. On the left, uh, no, on the right of the screen, that's the traditional page. This is actually a very helpful slide in, in telling you what's there. Again, Mishnah, is the first section, the written down, and it's very concise. Again, think about the code of the United States just says law, 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 okay? The Supreme Court decisions and the congressional record tell us how we got to the law, and that's what the Gemara is. And key thing for any, well, my whole life in the Navy, 20 years in the Navy, everywhere I got, there was always one Christian chaplain said, oh my gosh, what an opportunity for me to be stationed with a rabbi. And again, out of 900 Navy chaplains, there are only 10 rabbis, so most Christian chaplains or Muslims wouldn't be stationed with one. So I can finally learn Hebrew. And I said, and sometimes people got really upset when I said, no, 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 no. You're never gonna learn enough Hebrew to understand the nuances. What I can teach you is how we read the Torah as Jews. And we never just read it kiver to kiver, as some of my Southern friends would say, but always with, just as this page shows us, 
All of the things around Mishnah and Gemara are the work of other rabbis over the centuries explaining what they thought it meant. And then people saying, no, Rashi was wrong. No, the Tosavot were wrong. And so again, if you want to know the Hebrew Bible, I would suggest, I can suggest ways to unlock it without the he- without the Hebrew. So that's what a page of Talmud looks like. There are 2,722 pages of Talmud, and a page is a front side and a back side. So you saw some of the, uh, you saw a picture of that giant bookshelf. That's the basis, that's the starting point for how we know and do, oh gosh, know and do Jewish things, okay? From this point, so if you were to find a wacky passage in the Talmud, and believe me, there are plenty of wacky passages, like a a man falls from the ceiling, falls from the roof, and he happens to fall on top of a woman. And <clears throat> so what sacrifices is he liable for? Okay. Uh, very interesting. He has to pay a penalty for shame and humiliation besides uh, for her shame and humiliation, besides her medical bills and so on. So you can find any number of wacky passages. This is but a snapshot in time of how people struggled to find God's will for them. That gets redacted or refined through the codes. I mentioned Maimonides, mentioned all the way down to the 20th century. There are what are the authoritative guidebooks. And again, things are still being written today. People want to know what's God's will for them. I'm gonna give you a perfect example. The masks that we're all wearing, right, except for me, have a metal strip at the nose. So here's the question. It's the Sabbath. Putting that on, can you bend the metal strip for a tighter fitting? Because one of the 39 categories of forbidden Sabbath activity is metal work. Okay, just like sewing, just like chopping, just like harvesting, just like grinding, just like tying a knot or untying a knot. Okay, metalwork is forbidden. So half of the Jews who, when they read, uh, rabbis gave an answer, said, is that ridiculous? Does God have better things to do than to worry about getting your mask to a good fit? Now, again, of the Jewish world, I said reform, conservative, and orthodox, uh, the way things shape out in America, 90% of Jews are non-orthodox, which means they are not, they, they don't start from the point, God said all of this and we have to figure it out. They said, yeah, God was in there somewhere and it's important, but quite frankly, how we live is the starting point for bringing sanctity into our lives as opposed to struggling with the law and figuring it out. So most Jews dismiss that as a, golly, um, I guess I'm the odd reform rabbi, or it's my own spiritual journey. It's like, oh my God, in a confusing world, isn't it amazing that there's a process to find out, at, to have one point of certainty? I'm gonna die from COVID. I don't know what's causing all of this, but at least I can know that I'm not offending or violating a system that I've lived my whole life in, Sabbath observance, and I know about this. So what's the answer? Why can you bend them, do that metal work as it were? Two reasons. One, to save a human life, to save a human life, any of the ritual commandments can be violated. So when they discover that the cure for cancer really is bacon, we're all gonna be chowing down on bacon because <laughs> it cures cancer and it, save, and it saves our, our, our lives. So any of the ritual commandments, don't work is a ritual commandment. Now, if someone put a gun to my head and said, okay, uh, I'm gonna kill you unless you kill Bonnie, I can't do, I can't save my own life at the expense of her life. I have to accept martyrdom in a case like that. But it's gun to my head, eat a ham sandwich or I'll kill you, start chowing down. Okay, <laughs> so saving a life, saving a human life, but what's the other thing? 
and it comes straight out of the Talmud. The difference between work being permanent or temporary. How did I put my tie on this morning, even though I'm prohibited from tying a knot? Because this is temporary. My shoelaces are te is a temporary knot. So the bending of the mask is a temporary thing. It's not a permanent, undoable act of work. So the top, oh, was that my last slide? No, that was just me talking. Oh, that was my cue, probably to stop. Was that it? No, just keep going. Okay. Put the, okay, great. The 2,722 pages, how do I know that? Because I'm a member of the oldest Jewish book club where people are reading. It's only a century old, but it predates Oprah. Uh, <laughs> Jews, Jews throughout the world are reading a page of Talmud every day. Now, it's two pages, so first of all, it sounds bigger than it is. What's the real problem? It was written in Aramaic a long time ago. And while the Mishnah, all those, those are the actual words. And you could probably make sense of them. It's a question. Uh, from when does one recite the Shema, the hero Israel in the evening? From the time when the priests enter to partake of their truma, those are all words, until the end of the first watch. That's a, that's a known thing. This is a statement of Rabbi Eliezer. We always quote our sources, the rat, that's an individual. The group, can, the group think is until midnight, and Rabban Gamliel gives a lenient opinion. But from there, look at the bottom of this. Only the words in black are actually there on that Talmud page. Bold, bold. Everything else is there to try to make sense of it. So it is a big deal. Uh, so to Doug's table, I was saying this morning that I, normally on Saturday, I have a class that I go to before worship. Uh, it's led by a 90 year old and we're chewing over, you know, sentence by sentence, what this stuff means. But again, it's a snapshot. This is just a curiosity. Uh, it goes over much better in, um, when I talk to Catholics. But again, how would you go from 2,700, how would you get to 2,700 printed pages? Well, from manuscripts, can you imagine the work? Well, a Christian printer with the very Jewish name of Daniel Bomberg in Venice came up with that layout that layout of the page is the one that's been followed ever since, since the 1500s. So again, Jews and Christians, we're, we've had, we're frenemies, mostly we're, fr we're obviously we're friends here. Sometimes we've been frenemies, sometimes just enemies, but just as the Gospels has a historic record of uh, the development of Judaism, so indeed Daniel Bomberg saved the Talmud. Uh, I really, okay. Um, modern printed editions of it. This one is on, the one that I'm carrying around, but we'll whiz through it. So here's, here's what I gotta say. Okay, so if this is your picture of what Jews look like, okay, or this is who's interested in studying Judaism, you're certainly not wrong, okay? Uh, most Jews do indeed, most Jews do indeed uh, look like me, only better looking, um, but don't wear a uniform, okay? Just like, hey gosh, well, you all aren't, none of you ladies, Bonnie, don't, you don't have that little bonnet on the back of your head, and uh, I see Jim's wear has a, is it buttons or a zipper, whatever it is? Okay, no, you're not all Christians are Amish or Mennonite. Not all Jews are Hasidic or wear a uniform. So modern Jewish, modern Jewish interpretations, the face of, of Talmud study, of Jewish study, is for men, is for women. Okay, I'm definitely going to stop there. Good, that was the last slide. So I took you into the weeds with Talmud and Talmud study just to make the point that the Bible, the revelation from that's written down, Moses to the people, God to Moses to the people, that's the starting point. Understandably, it's perhaps sometimes the stopping point for some Christians. Judaism is a vibrant religious civilization, ever evolving with chains of authority. So the people at Congregation Knesset Israel are probably gonna listen to me if I say don't do something. The people at Sons of Israel are gonna listen to their own rabbi, 
Okay, and that's just the way it is. Birds of a feather flock together, uh, but we have the way to understand what God's will is for us in the here and now, and to indeed, as my bio said, to bring spirituality into our lives and tikkun olam, the repairing of the world, the caring for the world into everyone's life. So I'll Stop there. Uh, feelings won't be hurt if you want your 15 minute break right this instant. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I should say that in my retirement, I really, through the Conference of Churches, will be writing to all the constituent organizations, at least in the Lehigh Valley, to say, I'm happy to do this talk or any talk uh, for an adult Sunday school class or things like that. So uh, this doesn't need to be the end, but rather, as I always say, to be continued. Okay, thanks. Okay. Questions? Oh. Whoa. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. By the door. Uh, just shout, just, oh, gosh. No. Oh, <laughs> the Derek people shouting. at home. Right, okay. Yeah. The same people can't hear. So, do you think Jesus was familiar with the Talmud? I know it wasn't written down yet, but... Working? Okay, here. Do you think Jesus was familiar with the Talmud tradition, and, and is it possibly why he taught the way he taught in parables that didn't give clear answers, but said, you know, it could be this, it could be that. I mean, uh, yeah, Jesus is true. Okay. So, 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 so again, uh, not, not for me to say, you all got the Pharisees all wrong. Okay. Not, not for me to say that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll simply say that the sort of the, that the temple crowd, the priestly crowd, the get along with the Romans crowd, the we don't believe in heaven or the resurrection of the dead crowd, those are the Sadducees. They ended when the temple was destroyed. Um, I won't say that Jesus is Pharisee. I'll simply say that that tradition of question and answer, of going back to sources, but understanding people, that exists. Okay. I mean, the Talmud wasn't written down as such, but that's how, because the contemporary rabbis taught that disagreed with each other, gave honor to dissenting opinions. So yes, he's, Jesus is, Jesus the Jew is definitely a product of first century. How do we survive in this awful world? We want to know the will of God. Okay, good. Short answer. Other question? We have one from the chat from Robert okay. Mies who asks, where do Jews for Christ fit into your grouping? Um, not at all. Thank you. So... <laughs> Yeah. So, so, so the answer is we, we, we got a, a two groups of people. Okay. So I'm aware of how attractive Judaism is for some Christians who being starved of ritual in their current interpretation want to year of biblical living, get back to the source. What was it that our guy did? So uh, a tabernacle for Sukkot or eating matzah or things like that. So that's, that's great. And there are some congregations that are organized like that, but indeed, um, ah, oh gosh, remember what I said? Right. Every Jewish human being is born neutral with the ability to choose good or to choose evil and can fully connect with God on his, her, or their own. So the need for an intermediary, an intercessor, uh, and the view that we're all inherently sinful from birth. So that's so far outside of, of, of Judaism that if you embrace those beliefs, just like uh, Lord Ganesh or Buddha or whomever, you're now. <laughs> in America, we've discovered you can call yourself anything you want. And since a majority of Jew of, of Jewish Americans feel that a sense of humor is a more defining characteristic for God, for being a Jew than believing in God. So Gavalt. Okay. So we have no reason to disregard them. It's pretty obvious that they're a completely different religion, but Okay, but it's a free choice, free marketplace. Okay, lady in the front. I guess um, I would 
want you to speak to and what makes me uncomfortable is the do it yourself. Because it suggests sometimes that um, there's an absence of God. And I just wanted you to speak. Oh, hmm. yeah. I, okay. I, I, um, maybe not, but I, I thought that you should expound a little okay. bit on that. And I, and I know that some of the ritual, uh, the washing of hands and the like, um, is similar to that of our Muslim brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have the same kind of thinking. And so there's a lot of commonality, but um, I don't know. Uh, when you say it's it's one where you're expected to do it yourself. And oh, mm, okay. I, I just think if you could elaborate a little bit sure, on that. Sure, okay. Because as a, as a Christian... I don't feel I can oh, do oh, it oh, on myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, Thank you. Got yeah. it, got it, got it. Okay, this is the... And I know you honor God. I just saw, I saw in one of your slides where you wrote his name, left out the vow and... Right, um, right, right. Yeah, so I, 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 I saw that okay. and noticed that. So I so, just wanted so, to... So, okay. That. So thank you very much. This is, um, you know, Winston Churchill said, uh, the Americans and the English are two great people separated by a common language. So uh, as Jews and Christians, we are separated sometimes by, by a common language. No, do it and do it yourself. Both are based on our relationship, our essential relationship with, with the Lord God, with, with the creator. The do it yourself means, um, <clears throat> That obligation falls on everyone. It's like, I mean, you would react in the same sort of way. Pastor, you be the Christian and let us do get back to work, okay? You, you would have the same reaction. So I'm simply saying that, uh, indeed, while I've, well, don't report back, but, but there are plenty of Jews whose only interaction with Judaism is they come to the synagogue to have Judaism done for them, and then they leave for a week free of Jewish thought or values or all that. So the do-it-yourself means no, it falls not just on the rabbi to be your Jew, uh, it means it falls on each of us to establish this relationship with God. Okay, yeah. Good, thanks. Okay. All right, we have two more questions. That's all we're going to take. Okay? okay, gosh, okay. Invite me. Bonnie will know how to get a hold of me. Right. Um, in the 1980s, during the AIDS epidemic, I attended a synagogue or worshipped in a synagogue in New York mm -hmm. that had carved in stone in huge letters in the synagogue the words from Isaiah, my house shall be a house of prayer for all people. Mm -hmm. And um, I took that back to my congregation in New York, and we we decided to welcome people with AIDS, but we continued the phrase, my house shall be a house of prayer for all people. Thus says the Lord God who gathers the outcasts. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about what we're doing right now in our world with discrimination and everything else. And I, I, didn't, I didn't really hear you address those kind of issues. And I'm wondering what you would say about that. Sure. And if we had hours more, again, I, Bonnie used <laughs> I the word, Bonnie used the word, two words actually, tikkun olam, and I referred to that, literally for the repair of the world. So Jews, all Jews do believe that God and God's creative majesty created this place, but indeed left little corners of it for us. So our mission, our calling is to repair the world. Uh, I'll simply say that some have re regarded the, uh, the reform Jewish movement as uh, hard to distinguish between the Democratic Party's principles and reform Jewish uh, activities. So there's plenty of social justice, social action out there in, in Judaism. I talked about something long before that, which I thought is equally a mystery. But again, Jews are out there, were out there with Martin Luther King. Jews are there on the border. Jews are da da, -da for Ukraine and so on. And uh, yes, uh, the, the awareness that um, for most Jews will look at the whomever and not see a stranger, but see brother, sister, or other. Okay. L uh, one more question. Jeff, Thanks. Up here. Jeff Kessler. Jeff. Um, thinking about Judaism's uh, emphasis on doing, um, would you comment on your perception of the nation of Israel and the um, land? 
So, and that re- as that relates to Jews in the present, or maybe as it relates to you. Yep, I can do that for sure and really briefly. And so what I'm going to say is coming from the left side of Judaism and finding a place um, with other folks. So you cannot understand Judaism without a connection to the land of Israel, either as the large, the world's largest Jewish community or the place where, uh, you know, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And that was the temple in uh, in, in physical Jerusalem. So I really do understand um, that Israel, Palestine, Israel, excuse me, and Palestine do cause a great deal of heart sickness and rending and two peoples and conflicting narratives and so on and so forth. I'm going to say two, two things. One is the people that I worship with Um, have children who live in Israel, have grandchildren who live in Israel. And so Israel is much more personal to me uh, than it was um, a long long time ago. The other is I'll give, um, just remember the words Shalom Hartman Institute. Okay, so the Shalom Hartman Institute, both in Israel and in the United States, have leadership programs that bring Jews and Muslims together, bring uh, Israelis and Palestinians together to see where is a way of um, peace would be great. Peace would be great. Not killing each other would be uh, even better. Uh, I know that on our um, Israel Independence Day, when 13 orphans were killed because three dads were axed to death. Not just gunshot, violent, bang, okay? I pull the trigger, bang, someone's dead. No, you kill someone with an ax, you have, there has to be a backstory, there has to be a passion, and there has to, and I'm gonna ask that you accept my sense of tragedy and loss. So I'm so sorry, so Jeff, thank you. Don't call on him next time, okay? Okay, sorry. Um, No, 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 no. Um, I'll circle us back. No, 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 no. In, in, in truthfulness, I'll ask you just to think that there might be another side of the story. Okay, that's, that's actually, it's not special pleading for my side of the story. It's just to take it with uh, a grain of salt and to remember that where we are building bridges together. And again, Hadassah Hospital. My God, every week in Hadassah Hospital, you have a heart transplant that a dying Israeli gave a heart to a Palestinian and so on. On the ground, not in the newspapers, but on the ground, you see these everyday opportunities. Not enough of them, but you do. But meaningful conversations, uh, looking forward to continuing meaningful conversations on all topics, Jeff, uh, on all topics. (laughs) Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you so good, good, good. much for okay. being with us. Oh, thank I'm you. gonna give you back your symbol right. okay. and a thank you so much. A pleasure. And uh, I'm off to Philadelphia, so this is, you know, the Sabbath is a day of, of rest, except for rabbis, just like Sunday is for clergy. For those of you who are going from this spiritual moment back down into the vineyard and to the parish for uh, for tomorrow. So thank you all to be continued. Okay. Thank you.